Now I need to explain how I got into this telomere business. Actually, can you hear me in the back? Or, okay, very good. Because that's really not my turf. So my turf are funny DNA structures, expandable DNA repeats, and here am I on the turf of ginger, Tisha, other people. Uh, so, and I actually got there by pure serendipity, and this happened uh, due to this gentleman, Ranjit Anad, who was a grad student at Tufts. wasn't even my graduate student. He was actually Catherine Freudenreich, graduate student. But for better or worse, he took my course on DNA structure and function, and he got actually fascinated by this, you know, structure prone DNA repeats. And so one day he walks into my office and he says, Sergey, you must have in your freezer some DNA repeats which people in your lab are not currently working on. And I said, well, you are very welcome to my freezer. <laughs> and <clears throat> so what he found there were all these telomeric repeats from various organisms, yeast, tetrahymena, and human, which I cloned back in my postdoctoral years in the Soviet Union, and then I smuggled them from the Soviet Union. <laughs> and then they were in my freezer for like 20 plus years, and no one had any interest in working on them, right? And so he got those guys, and next day he comes to him and he says, Sergey, you know, it's wonderful DNA, it's still super cold. And I said, well, sure, it was isolated by these bare hands using, you know, old-fashioned cesium chloride, etidium bromide, you know, gradient centrifugation, so nothing ever happens with this DNA. And that was the beginning of this work for us. And I'm going to tell today about this yeast telomeric repeats, which were cloned there, so Ranjit took them, recloned them into yeast plasmid, And then what he saw after two gels that there is a replication fork stolen. And so you can see here in the G orientation, when Girish strand of the repeat serves as a Legan strand template, it's exceptionally prominent. And it's much weaker when it's in a C orientation. It's about four or five times weaker if you quantitate this. So now but then we did another experiment. We knocked down the protein called TOF1, which has already been mentioned several times. And you see this very strong replication stall, which is equivalent to this one, got a lot weaker. And in this moment, we had to say goodbye to funny DNA structures, because it's really in yeast what happens that if you knock down TOF1, the structure-mediated stalls become more prominent. And I think that we know why. But protein-mediated stalls, which several groups, us including, showed, become much weaker. And we don't know why, for sure. But at least, you know, this is the fact of the matter. Uh, okay, so that was very good. Uh, so then what protein binds to the sequences in yeast is, of course, RAP1. That's its normal function. And so in this paper we published with uh, Ranjit and uh, Catherine Freudenreich, of course, we proposed that, oh, before I go there, sorry. So th that is, this, this one is really an equivalent of high-speed collision, right? So the replication for bumps is a very prominent. So, and this is a very kind of low-speed collision, you know. So, so we proposed in this paper that Rab Pan, tightly bound to their repetitive consensus sites, uh, is a, a replication barrier. Uh, which seems polar. And then what happened that Pombi people gave us a hell. So not Tony, not Tony Carr. Tony was nice to us, but other Pombi people, uh, Julia Cooper primarily. And the reason being that in Pombi it's exactly opposite. So in Pombi, RAP1 doesn't bind to the chromosomal ends. It's TAS1 that binds there and then brings in uh, RAP1. And in POMBI, TAS1 actually helps replicate in telomere sequences by normal replication fork. But here was exactly the opposite. So we were in a sort of a limbo state with that, but luckily enough, this couple years ago, the two uh, independent conf confirmation came. One was from two groups in Rutgers, including Andrea Cervesa, a former postdoc with Ginger, and they showed that RAP1 is responsible for fork stalling and breakage. And another one that is biochemical work that came out from Wash U, uh, 
uh, from two labs, one is Peter Borgerson and another Kalata's lab. And they show that P1, or oh, actually the trap one blocks the pole delta. And there are some subtle differences between these papers and our papers, and I wouldn't go into there, but at least we can say definitively now that RAP1 inhibits replication for progression both in vitro and in vivo. Okay, uh, so the second step of this work was this our previous system that was developed by Alex Shishkin in my lab, how to study large-scale expansion on yeast. And this system is based on this Euro 3 gene, which was already mentioned before, and that is a wonderful marker because it can be selected forward and against. Uh, but what, what we did here, we split it artificially with an intron and we inserted the expandable JREP, that's Friedrich's ataxia JREP. And so what happens is that yeast are little humans, so they have short introns, and if introns get longer than 1 kb, they cannot be spliced anymore. So if the repeat expands, that, that becomes euro minus, and you can detect these events on a 5-FOA, 5-fluorotic uh, acid containing media. So then Alex did it a while ago, and he really observed this massive large-scale expansion of J repeats. But he also saw two events which were relatively more rare, uh, these deletions or chromosomal rearrangements and some mutations. But the primarily event for the expendable repeats we studied was this very large-scale expansion. So we got a lot of credit for the system in terms of studying repeat expansions. So, so we had this too, though. We had this replication fork stolen caused by inter, uh, white tail repeats, and we had this system where we can insert any repeat. And so what's the rationale of studying interstitial telomeric repeats in our system? So yeast actually don't have interstitial telomeric repeats. They have very short ITSs right at the junctions between the X and Y prime elements. I think they were discovered by Tom Peters. But humans do have a lot of interstitial telomeric repeats, and they go in two flavors. They call so-called head ITS, which is very long, peristromeric repeats, and short ITSs, which are at various chromosomal positions. And so these short ITSs are very lens polymorphic. They coincide with the fragile sites. They cause chromosomal aberrations. They were uh, linked to chromosomal breakpoints and gastric cancer and some other cancers. They were also linked to translocations in patients with prader willi syndrome. So they're really very unstable. But strangely enough, very little is known about the mechanism of these instabilities. And that's what we wanted to check in our system. Uh, so here comes Anna Aksenova, who was a very talented postdoc in the lab and who did all of the work I'm going to talk about in the remainder of my time. And it was done in collaboration with Tom Peters, who obviously doesn't need any introduction. Uh, so this is the system we got. So this is uh, Euro 3, split Euro 3. We the East telomeric repeat inserted. Here's an G orientation, so this is a high-speed collision. The trip marker, which we used to integrate this cassette, and it's right, uh, oops, sorry. Okay, so it's right adjacent to this uh, Euro 3 marker, and very strong early firing replication origin IRS 306, so it's an all on chromosome 3. And when we detected these five FOA-resistant clones, what we found that actually none of them has large-scale expansions, but a lot of them has this chromosomal rearrangement, which is indicated here by the lack of the PCR product. Now, I need to orient you on the two things here. So first of all, what is the rate of this chromosomal rearrangement? And it's really remarkable. So you see it's very rare event without repeats. It's a 3 to 10 to the minus 9 per replication. And you, had, you inserted only 15 telomeric repeats, and it goes up three orders of magnitude. So it's really, really amazing. And I need to orient you on chromosome 3. So this system differs from Kalodner's system as one substantial regard. So this is the centromere of chromosome 3. Our cassette is in the left arm of it, about 80 kb away from this left telomere. But there are essential genes on the left and on the right. So you actually cannot lose this arm under no circumstance. And this is very important. And now these elements are, these errors, large and small errors, are TY and gamma delta elements, which were all mapped on chromosome 3, largely by Tom Peters. And that would be very important uh, in a second. Okay, so we can look at this 
rearranged clones, what happens with chromosome 3. And we see right away that there are, this is a Chef gel, so the pulse field gel, and you see there are four classes of events. The event number one, which is chromosome 3, basically original size. Nothing happens. And yet it's Euro minus 5 of resistant. It's actually trip minus as well. The chromosome 2 has a small deletion, which is probably the easiest outcome. The, the class 3, they have actually gigantic third chromosome. And then class 4 has a much, much shorter chromosome. So what happens here? So these are really gross chromosomal rearrangements, similarly to what is observed with human short ITSs. Uh, so if I go back for a second, uh, so the two markers, one telomere proximal, CHA1, another centromere proximal, LU2. So what happens there? Uh, we take this CHEF gel, we hybridize it. With the centromere proximal, we see more or less the same. This is class one event, class two, class three, class four. With the CHA1 hybridization, we actually see that in all class three and class four events, you see this mysterious ATKB long chromosome. And recall our, our cassette is ATKB away from the left telomeric end. So, okay, so what happens here? So the, you can do then a microarray hybridization. You see nothing much happens in chromosome 3 with the hybridization, yet it's Euro 3 minus, trip minus. Uh, class 2 has a small deletion. Class 3 has a giant duplication of right arm of this chromosome. And then class 4 is a hybrid, actually, between chromosome 3 and chromosome 2. So how this happens? So clearly there was a break as a result of this double-stranded break, as a result of this high-speed collisions. And then what happens? So class 1 as it turned out, so we obviously clone and sequence all these junctions, and so we actually know for sure what happened. So class one is a very interesting event. So I had a break here, and then the inversion of this hollow arm of the chromosome three. And when you get this, uh, you basically, basically have the same size chromosome, and your three is now split, so that's your minus. Why is it trip minus? And the reason why is it trip minus is that now you have a long telomere adjacent to the trip gene. And we, we're dealing here with a position variegation effect, which can be reversed if you treat cells with a nicotinamide. So this is actually a very cool situation altogether. Tom is now studying the mechanism, the genetic control of these inversions. Uh, class two events, you have this break in the Euro 3 gene, and our strain, stupidly enough, because we never thought of removing it, has a Euro 352 in its original location on chromosome 5. So now U gets invaded into this U on the chromosome 5, and gene conversion occurs between the TY element splitting Euro 3 and this TY element in LHS side. And you got a short deletion of chromosome 3. Uh, class 3 event is even cuter, so you have a break here, and then, oops, sorry, and then dissection, no, I could never figure it out, <laughs> and then dissection from this end up, you know, up to this element, sorry, up to this element, and then invasion into this FS2, and the gene conversion. So the result, the duplication of the right arm of chromosome 3. But as I said, you cannot lose this portion, so that stands as a mini chromosome. And then a class 4 event is the same conversion event between the chromosome 3 and chromosome 5. So that's really all very good and well. Last thing I want to tell about that, what happens, why this mini chromosome is so stable. And that's also a very cool story. So here, this, uh, uh, for yeast aficionados, this is at a minus yeast. So they are red, meaning that, you know, it's pretty healthy strain. Uh, and the problem is that this chromosome 3 has two cassettes, HML and HMR, which is a mating type loci silent cassettes, and they talk to each other in actually in vivo in the genome architecture as was demonstrated using 3C. And so what we believe happens here that this small chromosome, HML is on the small chromosome and it interacts with this HMR, sort of hops 
onto this, you know, truncated chromosome 3 and in this way being stably maintained. So this is really a very cool result of high-speed collisions. Now, what happens with the low-speed collisions? In the low-speed collisions, we have the same repeat and the opposite orientation. It's actually very deadly uh, for wrist. Uh, you see this 15 repeats made it euro minus completely and 5 fa resistant completely. Eight repeats, a sort of intermediate phenotype, grow slowly on both media. You can pick up this papilla, and these are faster growing colonies. And that happens because the splicing of the Euro 3 gene is blocked. But nevertheless, you can select either this uh, Euro plus or 5 a plus for real and see what happens with them. You would expect, if that was the same mechanism, you would expect the same thing. You would expect chromosomal rearrangements or other stuff. But actually, that's not what we saw. What we saw among 5 a resistant, we saw the small scale expansions from one to eight repeats, and the longer the expansion, the more 5 fa resistant it is. And in the sh contractions, in, in, in this Euros plus, we saw contractions. And again, the longer the contractions, the more Euro plus it is. And the rate is very high. So you see the rate of expansions here is up to 10 to the minus 3 per replication, which makes it among the most expendable DNA repeats comparable to the CAG, CTG repeats, which are known for to cause Huntington disease. So that's really quite striking. And then Anna did a lot of the genetic analysis, and this is a kind of the summary table for this genetic analysis, which is complicated, but I'll navigate it through you. So what happens here? So the wild type, as you see, this is 10 to the minus 3, close to 10 to the minus 3 per replication. That's an expansion rate. If you knock down TOF1 and CSM3, then it goes down 15 to 30 fold. And recall, these are the guys that make this replication stolen weaker. So it's clearly linked to this replication set, right? Now, these two guys, SRS2 and RAD5, these are, of course, you know, post-replication repair proteins, and again, 15 to 25-fold decrease. Uh, these two were already mentioned many, many times at this conference. These are RAT51 and RAT52 DNA recombination proteins. Again, 50, you know, up to 30-fold decrease in expansion. And now if you combine the two, so this is a... RAT51 SRS2, and you see this very synergistic. So the end result is as a low speed collision, the fork does not collapse, there are no breaks, it just moves slowly, and two things could happen. Uh, again, I'm going very quick through that. So this is this RAP1 sitting here, this is a low collision situation, so it kind of pauses, you know, idles one way or another, and so. In a repetitive run, you can go through this template switching, which is mediated by RAT5, and because it's repetitive, you can invade it out of register, so you will have small expansion or small contractions. Or if a gap is left behind past replication, then, you know, the homologous recombination can repair this gap. And we actually believe, based on our data, that SDSA is probably the most likely scenario here leading to expansions or contractions. So then, really very interesting high-speed collision break and massive, you know, chromosomal rearrangements and low-speed collisions, slow fork progression, gaps behind, and you end up with the lens polymorphism. So actually, both things are very nicely accounts for properties known for the short interstitial telomeric repeats in humans. So how about, okay, so then, and then Anna made this drawing what happens in this, you know, slow collision speed. And as, as we all know, when you do something creative, like you write a novel or you make a drawing, it tells more about an author than about the subject very often. And so Anna, who is now back in Russia, I think that this road really represents now the Russian road late at night, right? <laughs> Right, so you have all these, you know, obstacles on your way, and you slowly navigate through it, and you can go through various exits to finally pass this, you know, roadblock. It's not uh, insoluble. You can still go through. So that's a slow speed collision. 
Okay, so, so what happens with the human telomeric repeats, and they also can be tested in the system, and they show different properties. They largely show medium and large scale expansions, which are indicated here, and the genetic control is totally different. So we're trying to figure out now what it is. I think we have a good idea what it is, but that brings me to this last slide. The, as we say, this is a lab mantra that all stable repeats are alike and all unstable repeats are unstable in its own way. And we absolutely need new postdocs to study <coughs> unstable DNA repeats. And with that in mind, I'll, these are the people I mentioned who participated in this work. And of course, we are always grateful for NIH for supporting us notwithstanding all this problems is funding. Thank you so very much.